My name is Summer Wedlock, and I'm the Vice President of the Gardner Foundation. I would like to welcome you to the 2018 Gardner Foundation Public Lecture Series. It's being presented by TELUS Health, who is the sponsor of our entire public lecture series. I'd also like um, to thank the various sponsors that we have who make evenings like this possible. In particular, Merck Canada. I know we have some really great representation from Merck here tonight, so thank you all for joining us. <coughs> also, I'd like to thank the Government of Ontario and CIHR for their continued support of the Gardner Foundation. We have a great evening in store for you as we explore the changing landscape of lung cancer treatment and the future of oncology. For those who are unfamiliar with the Gardner Foundation, we have three main missions. The first is to recognize and celebrate excellence through the Canada Gardner Awards. Each year, we present awards for biomedical and global health research. We've given out more than 380 awards, and 89 of those laureates have gone on to win the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our second mission is to convene leaders. At Gardner, we believe in the importance of building a vibrant scientific community <coughs> by connecting audiences with world-class researchers. Every year, our laureates tour the country on an interactive lecture circuit. They meet with graduate students, fellow researchers, and industry leaders to share their exciting discoveries with curious minds. We also host research symposia and public lectures like this evening. Our third mission is to inspire the next generation. And we do this through our student outreach program. We bring our Gardner laureates to Canadian universities coast to coast, where they speak with high school students, because we aim to inspire the next generation of Canadian thinkers, entrepreneurs, and leaders. So tonight, we're very fortunate to have a good friend of Gardner here tonight in Andre Picard to act as our moderator for the evening. Andre is a health columnist for the Globe and Mail and one of Canada's top public policy writers and not to mention the author of many successful books. Please join me in welcoming Andre to the stage to get our event started. So thank you, Summer. Uh, this year, an estimated 206,000 Canadians will be diagnosed with cancer. There will be 80,800 cancer deaths, the leading cause of mortality in Canada. One in four of those deaths, 21,100, will be from lung cancer. But lung cancer doesn't get near the attention of breast cancer, prostate cancer, skin cancer, other high-profile diseases, all of which kill far fewer people. Now, for the longest time, learning you had lung cancer was an automatic death sentence. It was diagnose and adios, as one clinician said crudely. But that's changing. Five-year survival rates for lung cancer are still pretty grim. They're about 20%. By comparison, the five-year survival rate for all cancer now exceeds 60%. There's more than a million Canadians living today who've lived with after more than 10 years after a cancer diagnosis. Advances in care, like surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, drugs, have transformed cancer into a chronic illness for many people. Lung cancer is just now starting to catch up. And that's thanks to a host of new treatments, like uh, targeted therapies and immunotherapy. Tonight, we're going to hear about these new therapies. We're going to hear about the science. We're going to hear about the challenge of paying for them. And we're going to hear about the patient experience with these new drugs. We have three excellent speakers, starting with one of the world's leading lung cancer researchers, followed by a patient, and then an advocate. And I'll introduce them in more detail later. Now, I know you're all here to hear them, not me. So I'll turn the stage over in a moment. But because everyone has a personal cancer story, I want to share one of mine. Uh, in 1953, my grandfather was diagnosed with lung cancer at age 55. He was told to go home, get his affairs in order, and say goodbye to his 17 children. Yes, 17. He was a good French-Canadian Catholic. <laughs> now instead, he enrolled in a crazy experiment. One of his many sons happened to work at the Chalk River nuclear plant. Uh, so my grandfather became one of the first per people in the world treated with something new, the cobalt bomb, an early version of radiation therapy. He was blasted with, by today's standards, mind-blowing amounts of radiation. He not only survived, but he lived to the age of 88. Uh, he was a proud Cancer Society volunteer for 
33 years after he was cured. Now today, some lung cancer patients are under, undergoing equally revolutionary treatments. We're taking little pieces of their immune system, bolstering them in the lab, and re-injecting them. We're essentially getting their bodies to cure itself of cancer. That's as crazy as a bomb was in the 1950s. That's seven decades of progress in a nutshell, and there's much more to come. And the much more to come is important because fully half of us will eventually get a cancer diagnosis. One in two Canadians are now diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. So this stuff matters. So pay attention tonight. So let me now introduce our first speaker, Dr. Frances Shepard. She's the 2018 Canada Gairdner Whitman Award winner, recognized for her global leadership in oncology, which has contributed significantly significantly to improving survival outcomes of lung cancer patients in Canada and worldwide. Dr. Shepard has devoted her career to improving treatment and outcomes for patients with lung cancer at a global level. She's a medical oncologist at Princess Margaret Cancer Centre uh, here in Toronto and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Under her leadership, the Canadian uh, Clinical Trials Group Lung Cancer Site conducted many international practice-changing studies. Dr. Shepard has also designed and led paradigm-shifting clinical trials over more than three decades that have fundamentally changed treatment and outcomes for patients with lung cancer. So I'd like to invite Dr. Shepard to the stage. So thank you very much, Andre, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a whirlwind tour of lung cancer, but first of all, we have to do a little bit of a shout out to Mr. James Gardner, who really is the founder of the Gardner Foundation. Big Jim, he was known. He was a stockbroker, um, a businessman, most importantly, a philanthropist. And it was his vision not just to have Canadian awards for science, but to make these wards global and put Canada on the forefront of the scientific stage. And I think he has done that. So lung cancer, I'm very competitive. Uh, I love to be number one, but quite frankly, I really wish that lung cancer weren't the number one cancer killer in both men and women in Canada. Lung cancer causes more deaths than breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and prostate cancer combined. Now, of course, a lot of the nihilism around lung cancer is because it's caused by smoking. The vast majority of lung cancer is caused by smoking. We admit that. Smoking's not a sin. It may be foolish, but we do have to live with this fact. A little bit of a background about lung cancer. It's divided into two major types, non-small cell lung cancer, that's the vast majority of them, and then that's further subdivided. And adenocarcinoma is the one that mainly is caused by cigarettes, but is the type of cancer that we see in the lifetime non-smokers. And then squamous cancer and other subtypes. Small cell lung cancer is the fast-growing one. It represents only about 15% of our lung cancers, though. And then mesothelioma, which we know now is caused by asbestos. And of course, we are big asbestos producers in this country. Not all lung cancer uh, patients are smokers, though. About 30% of women are lifetime non-smokers who get lung cancer, about 10% of men. And the other thing is that as we've come to recognize the negative effects of cigarettes, 50% of our patients are ex or former smokers. And your risk of getting lung cancer after you stop smoking doesn't come back to that of a non-smoker until somewhere around 15 years after you stop. So that's the reason why many of our patients are former smokers. So when we look at lung cancer, we divide it into stages, stage one, two, three, and four, and it depends on the extent of spread. Stage one and two are local in the chest, and they are treated primarily with surgery for cure. Stage three has spread into the nodes in the center of the chest. 
They're generally not surgically resectable, and we treat those with radiation and chemotherapy with a chance of cure as the goal, even if the majority of patients are not cured. And then stage four is when lung cancer has spread outside the lung to the brain, the bone, the liver, and those patients are treated with palliative intent. And that's where a lot of our progress has been made, but that's where the nihilism really comes from for lung cancer. Part of the problem with lung cancer is that only a third of our patients are diagnosed in those stages one and two when they can be surgically resected with cure as the goal. And it basically breaks down a third, a third, a third, locally advanced, surgically resectable, and widespread metastases. So with that in mind, what can we do to improve the cure rate? Prevention goes without saying. We're doing everything we can to reduce cigarette consumption uh, in our population. And, and we're doing a fairly good job of that in Canada, by the way. But I'm going to focus next on early detection. So unfortunately, just think how big your lungs are. And lung cancers can hide in there without giving you any symptoms. So the symptoms often come quite late. And there have been numerous studies over the years of chest x-ray screening. And chest x-ray screening just never works. By the time you can see a lung cancer on a chest x-ray, it has been there for many months, even years and has probably disseminated. So all of the studies of chest x-ray have been negative. You can see that the curves parallel each other. But most recently, maybe around 10 or so years ago, came the concept of computed tomographic screening. Computed tomography cuts the chest into little slices and we can see lesions that are smaller than a dime. Originally, of course, when CT came in, it was really not a screening technique, but a diagnostic and a staging technique, and it was very expensive, and it was sometimes cumbersome. But the technology has progressed so far that a CT scan can now be done, a spiral CT scan that goes right through your chest, with a single breath hold. And this is called a screening CT. And with the technology advancing to this stage, there were several trials developed of screening CT. The first trials were just single arm trials. And it appeared that we could find early lung cancers and lung cancers that were at a curable stage. And so that led to this very large national lung cancer screening trial, and the results were presented in 2010 in the New England Journal, showing that low-dose screening reduced lung cancer mortality by 20%. And you can see here that on this side, with the low-dose CT screen, compared to chest x-ray, many more lung cancers were found, but despite more lung cancers, the death rate on the other side was reduced. And these curves show the death rate, showing a 20% reduction in uh, overall mortality. The Nelson trial has just recently been presented at the World Lung Cancer uh, Meeting, and this was a trial that originated from the Dutch. And once again, a confirmatory randomized study showing many more lung cancers found with CT screening over chest X-ray, as we expect, and the reduction in mortality. This is now; these were very mature results that were presented with reduction of 25% in year eight, nine, and 10 for males, and somewhat surprisingly, an even greater reduction in death for females. So two years ago, two and a half years ago now, 
the um, Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care said that adults from the age of 55 to 74 with a history of significant tobacco use should be tested for signs of lung cancer annually with three at least consecutive CT scans. So that's where we stand. I'll come back to this a bit in the end when I discuss some of our challenges in our own healthcare system. So how can we improve the cure rate? Better drugs for advanced stages. So whenever we introduce new drugs into our armamentarium, we take the patients in the most advanced stages who have fewer options, and if they work in advanced stages, we move them up into the earlier stages. We know that we seldom cure patients in advanced stages, but we're looking for the best drugs to move into the curative situation. And I'm not going to bore you with any randomized trials of one chemotherapy drug versus another, but I will just show you this graph. Way back when I first started, I was down here at that yellow bar. We were doing trials of best supportive care against chemotherapy. The BR5 trial was a definitive trial of the National Cancer Institute showing a survival benefit. And as the drugs got better and better and better, we were able to improve the one-year survival rates, these are, of patients with advanced lung cancer. You heard about how back in those days, it was thought, go home, get your affairs in order. Well, we now have many more and better treatment options for advanced stage. But we do these studies, A, to help the patients with advanced stage improve their system uh, symptoms and live longer, but eventually to move it into the post-operative situation where we can cure the patients. And this is where I have to give a shout out to two academic surgeons who sadly now have both died, but they were the surgeons that were leading our hospital, our institution at Toronto General Hospital, and leading a very large North American intergroup um, looking at improving adjuvant chemotherapy for lung cancer. So now we're focusing on that stage one and two, and you can see that there's lots of room for improvement. Those curves go down into the barely 50% range after surgery alone. So lots of room to do better. And there have been a total of 52 randomized trials of chemotherapy versus best supportive care in lung cancer. Unfortunately, the early trials of lung cancer study group were using drugs that were toxic. They were modestly effective, but still in all, we could improve survival. Despite those 52 randomized trials, when I started at the National Cancer Institute as the, the chair of the lung group, we still had not really convinced anyone of the use of adjuvant chemotherapy. So my next shout out comes to three important leaders at the then National Cancer Institute of Canada Clinical Trials Group, now the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. Um, and it was Joe Pater who invited me to chair the group in 1989, so that's a while back. And I call this a little perfect storm. I took over the group without any open trials, so our US and Canadian NCI grant reviews were coming up, and so I knew I had to do something pretty important uh, to be able to come before the panel to uh, get the money for another five years of funding. So what happened in 1989? We had a new third generation chemotherapy agent that was less toxic and more active. And at the same time, a new class of anti-nausea agents had come out. So this meant that we could give our platinum-based chemotherapy as an outpatient and not have to admit the patients for hydration and fluid flushing. And Burroughs Welcome was the manufacturer of both of these agents, and we approached Burroughs Welcome, and they were very open to collaboration. 
to help us set up a trial. And this led to our BR10 trial, which became a North American intergroup trial. All the US intergroup trial uh, groups joined. And this was a trial of observation, yet again, versus the new drug, venorobin and cisplatin. And for the first time ever, there was a huge benefit in survival, an absolute 15% difference at five years, and a relative reduction of 30%. And this was in all of our stage ones and twos. When we looked at stage two, the ones that had some regional spread to lymph nodes, the absolute difference of five years was 20%. Nothing like this had ever been seen before. Was it a fluke? Was it just that one in 20.05 by chance that this was a positive trial? Well, the answer to that is no. When we do big pooled analyses, we see that that venoral bean and cisplatin combination was the best and today remains the best. So this really was a landmark trial. It changed the cure rate for resected lung cancer, changed practice at a global level. How did we do at a local level? Well, Chris Booth, who was one of the trainees and is now a professor at Queen's University, did a population-based study. One of the nice things about being in a very managed healthcare system is that you can examine the populations. We had access to surgical records. We had access to chemotherapy treatment records. So we were able to look at the time before the BR10 results came out at the American Society of Clinical Oncology and after and we were able to tell the uptake of adjuvant chemotherapy. And there was considerable uptake. You can see that it improved considerably, not to 100% by any stretch of the imagination. We were then able to follow those patients, and we have very good death records, and we were able to see that the absolute death rate in our province went down by 5%. Now, to change a death rate at a population-based level is quite astounding. But when you look, the uptake was only in the range of 40% there, and when you try and examine that, you will see that the elderly patients uh, were not being referred, even though we can treat our elderly patients with some minor modifications. Some other interesting things came out that there were regional pockets that were not referring anyone. So this led to enormous education programs, changes in leadership at some of the centers um, to make sure that they were providing the best advice and referring their patients for adjuvant therapy. And the whole business about the elderly uh, Carmela Pepe, who's now a professor at McGill, was one of our residents, and she looked at our elderly, uh, elderly here defined as 65, so no offense to any of you out there if you're not quite that old. Um, and we can even have an enormous benefit even in our older populations. So that's the story about adjuvant chemotherapy, but going back to our more advanced disease, there has been really a revolution in our molecular understanding of cancer in general and lung cancer in particular. And lung cancer is almost the poster child for molecularly targeted therapy. So what's happened in the technology? When I started back in 1989, we were doing Sanger sequencing one gene at a time we had to have snap frozen tissue. By the 90s, we were able to do more gene expression profiling. And by the 2000s, with the Cancer Genome Project, we were able to sequence the whole genome to identify mutations, copy number alterations, deletions, etc. And what we have learned is that lung cancer 
is one of the most highly mutated cancers of all. It's way up there at the end of the spectrum with melanoma. And this, of course, is because of the known carcinogen smoking. Unfortunately, though, most of the known cancer mutations are not necessarily driver mutations. They're just kind of bystander mutations. They're not driving the, the cancer. And many of them are not mutations that we can target. But what we are really hoping for is personalized therapy or precision therapy where we can take a patient's tumor, we can molecularly profile it, we can identify the gene changes, and then treat those specifically. Unfortunately, you'll see on your left-hand side um, that the two most frequent genes have little red X's on top of them, and that means that, unfortunately, we do not have targeted therapy for those genes. We do have targeted therapy for some of the other genes, though, and the next most frequent one is the epidermal growth factor receptor. And the epidermal growth factor family is very interesting. As you can imagine from the term growth, it's a family of receptors that propel cancer growth. And when they are deranged, we get rapid growth, we get invasion, proliferation, metastasis. And so this was one of the first pathways to be targeted in lung cancer. And the EGFR pathway is very important in lung cancer with overexpression of the pathway in probably 95% or so of the tumors. Around this time, there were two forms of targeting the pathway, one with antibodies and one with oral medications that targeted the kinase ty ty tyrosine domain of the pathway. And so we developed the BR21 trial. At the time, we didn't select for EGFR expression because we thought almost all lung cancer is expressive. And this was a randomized trial for patients who had exhausted all of their treatment options. And they were randomized to a placebo or one of these oral pills that targeted EGFR. And lo and behold, this was a positive trial. We reduce, reduced the death rate in patients who had gone through every other possible form of therapy by 30%. It was considered landmark. It led to the approval of this agent, and it changed practice at a global level. But what we realized with these EGFR tyrosine kinase domain inhibitors was that there was a subpopulation that had dramatic, dramatic responses. White is bad on these x-rays, black is good. And you can see that after starting these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, within a month, the x-ray has cleared. It wasn't the majority of patients, but a substantial proportion of patients had amazing responses. And this is what really led to the identification of mutations, driver mutations, in the EGFR gene. And in adenocarcinoma of the lung, that accounts for 17% of our patients. And that has changed practice. Now, these patients don't get chemotherapy at all. We have numerous oral TKIs that we can give them, and every study has shown that the TKIs are superior to chemotherapy. And now, with these TKIs, we're expecting one-year survival rates, in actual fact, that are closer to two years, in the range of a year and a half to two years, um, and maybe even three and four years um, for these patients. So who are these patients that have these mutations? Well, interestingly, they're women. They're often Asian women, almost always the adenocarcinoma subtype, 
and non-smokers. We always knew that little subset was there before, but we never paid much attention to it until this class of drugs came along. And if you're a female Asian and a non-smoker, you have a 60% chance of having one of these EGFR, tyrosine kinase domain mutations. And that's in large part what leads to these numbers of 30% of women with adenocarcinoma not being smokers. And Greg Corpanti, who's now gone back to Ireland and is a professor there, looked at almost a thousand non-smokers that we had in our databases at the Princess Margaret Hospital. And among the non-smokers, 50% of them had EGFR mutations. And we now know that there are many other mutations. And these are among the driver mutations in non-small cell lung cancer that we have targeted therapies for. So I just show you this again because you'll see that the curves all go to ground. We don't cure anyone with these oral medications, but we're now learning about what makes the cancers resistant, and we now have resistance mutations. And we have specific therapies, third generation EGFR TKIs, all in the space of less than 10 years to treat the mu resistance mutations. And just look at the difference in benefit that we get over chemotherapy. We just keep keeping that chemotherapy wolf away from the door for these patients for years. But the technology has improved even further. And now we are able to look for these mutations using peripheral blood. The cancer cells and the, C the DNA of the tumors are shed into the blood, and we can find the mutations in the blood. It's not quite as sensitive, but it's about 80% as sensitive as doing an invasive tissue biopsy of the lung or the liver, and ever so much more easy on the patient. And we can do it repeatedly. Lastly, harnessing the immune system. And for sure, the immunotherapy tsunami is upon us. I've been doing immunotherapy trials for 30 years, and it's only in the last few years that these trials have borne fruit. And they've borne fruit with a group of drugs that target PD-1 and PD-L1. And these are drugs that actually take the breaks off the patient's immune system. And we have four drugs that are now approved in Canada for use in the second line, in the first line, and even in stage three. And I'll just show you the first trials were done with a drug called nivolumab. And these were very dramatic studies that compared this immune drug to chemotherapy and showed significant benefits in response and even overall survival and markedly less toxic than chemotherapy. Pembrolizumab, another drug of the same group, same results. Uh, atezolizumab, somewhat less um, dramatic results, but all in the right direction. So we started in the patients that had had all their previous treatments, didn't have many to offer, and then moved it up into the first line, so the first line. And this is a landmark trial that has compared an immune therapy to chemotherapy. And just look at the benefit. The immunotherapy are the rows on the top there significant benefit compared to chemotherapy and much less toxic. We've also looked at patients getting chemotherapy plus the immune therapy, and that's better than chemotherapy alone. And in stage three, where chemotherapy and radiation is given routinely, but we still, although we aim for cure, we only cure about 25%, we have another landmark trial that looked at the addition of immunotherapy after chemotherapy and radiation. Significant 
progression-free benefit, and at the World Lung Meeting last month, the overall survival results showing a significant reduction in the risk of death and probably translating to an improved cure rate in stage three. And of course, we will be moving these agents up into our surgically resected group. So now the patients will get chemotherapy first, and then we have numerous trials of immunotherapy going on for another year after chemotherapy. And our own Canadian Clinical Trials Group uh, study has accrued about two thirds of its patients. We should probably complete accrual in a year. And then it'll be another two or three years after that before we have our results. But we are hoping to improve the cure rate after surgery. So, you know, the Minister of Health was supposed to be here, so I wanted to end with some challenges to throw out to the Minister, so I throw them out even though she's not here. And we truly have challenges at every step of the way. I go back to the screening program. Um, when screening was first being um, presented to us as an option, uh, we initiated a screening program um, of our own at the University Health Network. Uh, this was funded philanthropically um, by, by one of my patients, Lucy Wong, and that's her picture there. Where are we now? You remember I showed you that the recommendation came out in 2016 that there should be screening. Cancer Care Ontario initiated a pilot study in Ottawa, Sudbury, Lake Ridge. They didn't open the pilot study at our center because we were already screening and they knew we could do it, uh, although they are adding our center in January. The interim analysis will come in spring of 2019. And then there will be presentations to the Ministry of Health. How long will it take us for province-wide implementation? I have four question marks there. It's eight years since the publication of the landmark trial. And we don't have a program in Ontario yet. What about payment for our new drugs? You know, we used to get a new chemotherapy drug every three or four years. The price would go up a little. Um, and for the most part, we got access to those drugs in a pretty timely fashion. But now we're in the era of personalized and precision therapy. Those oral drugs that target specific molecular changes are expensive. The first problem with our precision therapy is that we require rapid molecular profiling to identify the cancers. The molecular laboratories are not widely available. The results take us three to four weeks to get. And the latest technology is not in use. Um, routine profiling of the peripheral blood is not in use. We have a program open at our center, but it is being paid for by the pharmaceutical industry that has the third generation drug that we need. We really need more budget in the hospital global budgets to be able to support the molecular pathology laboratories. It is very difficult to get these tests. It's not like the US where a private lab will set up and the specimen is sent off and the insurance pays for it. To get something into our global hospital budget is very difficult. Molecular pathology is fighting with nursing, with paying for the drugs, paying for the operating rooms, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, going back to paying for the oral anti-cancer drugs, um, it's more complex. It varies by province. Some provinces, all cancer drugs are covered. In Ontario, oral drugs are not covered. They have to be paid for by the patient if they have private insurance, or we may have special access programs. But look at our um, list of targets for which we have molecularly targeted therapy, and we only have payment in our province for two of them. And for some of them, our province has said, no, you don't have randomized data. We won't support payment in the absence of randomized data. These are 1% mutations, and we aren't ever going to get the randomized data. So what is going to happen? So precision therapy requires rapid molecular profiling, and we need to take our profiling up into the 20th century with peripheral blood DNA testing. What about reimbursement for the immunotherapy tsunami? These are extremely, extremely expensive drugs. We have nivolumab paid for and reimbursed without the need for any testing for the target. Pembrolizumab was developed with testing as a requirement. And so in the first line setting, we have it paid for if they have very high expression of the ligand. In the second line setting, if they have any expression of the ligand, it is not approved with chemotherapy at all for payment here. Atezolizumab has been approved without the need for any testing. And Durvalumab, in the, uh, the one for stage three, where we're changing the cure rate for stage three, a decision has not been made to pay for it yet, but we get it with a compassionate program from AstraZeneca. So these drugs are extremely expensive, and it doesn't matter what your healthcare system is, um, it will have an impact. And here is a cost-effectiveness study that was done looking at second-line treatment with nivolumab uh, and pembrolizumab and showing whether they were cost-effective if you selected by the pdl one target. And under $100,000 is generally thought to be cost-effective. And if you don't select by the target, it's really not cost-effective. And the worst of all is a tezolizumab, which if you don't select by the target and select their highest expressing group, the cost per year of life gained is a quarter of a million dollars, and that is not considered cost effective. What is going to happen with stage three? It's approved by Health Canada without the need for a test, but we have a cure rate difference but these are the results that were just presented to us that if you do not express the ligand, and the test for this ligand is very easy. It's a simple immunohistochemistry test that every lab can do. The hazard ratio for survival was 1.36. That means that there was an increased risk of death by a third if they don't express the ligand. So the question is, should we be limiting reimbursement to the pdl one positive patients. And of course, in the adjuvant studies, we will have big hunks of tissue, and we should be able to sort this out very clearly. If these agents change the cure rate, though, in stage three, in stage one and two, then we must be able to pay for them. But I think we all have to be stewards of our healthcare dollars, and that includes the physicians, the patients, the pharmaceutical industry, and government. We used to say in lung cancer that a two-month prolongation of survival was meaningful, clinically meaningful to the patient, and that was our benchmark. With drugs of these costs, I think we have to submit a higher benchmark. I don't think we can treat with these drugs for a two-month benefit in survival. We have to be asking for more. 
not when drugs cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So we all have to be the stewards of our healthcare system. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Very informative, uh, very passionate talk. Our next speaker is going to be, uh, we're going to have two more brief speakers, then we'll have a little panel of uh, discussion. Our next speaker is Larry Friedman. Larry is a lung cancer survivor. He was diagnosed in 2016 with non-small cell lung cancer and has undergone several therapies in both the US and Canada. He currently lives here in his hometown, Toronto, and he's under the care of the fantastic oncology team at Princess Margaret. Larry? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Card. Uh, yes, I'm a lung cancer survivor, and before I tell you my story, um, I'll say uh, that the advanced treatments in the last five years, and the research that's been done, has catapulted uh, treatment for lung cancer far greater than the last 30 years. So let's say a lot has been happening, and as you can see with Dr. Shepard and her team. <clears throat> Even though the cancer has been labeled between patients as, uh, with subtle differences, um, the treatment response varies from individual patient to individual patient, meaning one type of uh, format will help one patient, but uh, it may not help somebody else. Uh, so the object is to find the key that unlocks the door that destroys these cancer cells. <clears throat> Whether it's chemotherapy, radiation, targeted therapy, or immunotherapy, one of the keys or a combination thereof is the key that will work for that patient, but not all will work for every patient. For this reason, uh, there's no cookbook for treating lung cancer, and the treatment for each individual patient has become very personalized. As you can see from Dr. Shepard's presentation, um, the personalized effect is very expensive. Um, however, it saves lives. And this is what we're, we're trying to do right now. I was diagnosed in uh, August 2016 with uh, non-small cell lung cancer, stage three, um, after a 14-week course of chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, there was no evidence of disease. Well, I thought I was in the clear. I spent my days re researching through PubMed online and uh, got very depressed looking at the uh, uh, five-year success rate, survival rate of 15%. I, I believe now it's 20%, and hopefully it's going to be 60 or 70%. Um, so I decided to change my focus and uh, focus directly on trying to find other survivors on the Internet, and I found a group of people, and the results were encouraging. I saw some people surviving five years, 10 years, even 15 years, and these were fantastic, but I, although we all had uh, advanced stages of lung cancer, they were all not treated the same way. Some of them were on targeted therapy, some were on immune therapy, and there are some long-standing individuals, uh, some individuals that had long-standing remissions on chemo and radiation treatment. Unfortunately, I didn't have a long-standing remission on chemo. Uh, eight months after I completed the chemo and radiation, I had a lymph node tested positive, and I went to, underwent biopsy. And at, the, at this time, I was living in, in the States, Florida, working in the US as a physician. And uh, my oncologist called me as I was boarding an evacuation flight because of Hurricane Irma. And he says, the molecular tests are back. Obviously, I was sweating. You have a high level of PTL1, very high level of PTL1 which means you're starting immunotherapy as soon as the hurricane leaves. So I said, well, I'm gone. So everybody else is gone, I guess, as well. Anyways, uh, at my first meeting after I got my first um, treatment, last September, a year ago, September, September 2017, my oncologist informs me that the FDA just approved this immunotherapy for a first-line treatment. Well, if I had this immunotherapy a year, year before, I wouldn't have had to go, undergo the uh, chemotherapy and radiation. Well, I'm not going to be looking at the cup being half empty. I've been on this immunotherapy now for 14 months, and my last scans showed no evidence of cancer. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jill, in the U.S., I asked her if I could say this, quoted her, 
she's a 10-year survivor, uh, and said, uh, said that we're not looking for a touchdown. We're looking for the next 10 yards and the first down. And that's what the fight is. I'd like to thank Dr. Shepard, Dr. Leal, Dr. Caveo, De Caveo, as well as uh, in Florida, my uh, oncologist in Florida, Dr. Kaplan, and the late Dr. Aliff, in addition to their whole team and the incredible brain power and tireless dedication to the early diagnosis and effective evolution of personalized treatment for lung cancer. It would be wonderful one day to say, cancer? What's that? That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Very inspiring little talk. Uh, our final speaker is Christina Sitt. Uh, she's the program manager at Lung Cancer Canada, Canada's only national charity focused solely on lung cancer. Her expertise lies in knowledge translation, targeting health professionals and the public. Uh, Christina is also a member of the International Association of the Study of Lung Cancer Advocacy Committee. Christina. Sorry, I'm vertically challenged. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out and um, supporting lung cancer patients. And I want to uh, give a shout out to Larry as well. Thank you for sharing your story. But I also want not to also acknowledge people that couldn't be here with us today. I want to talk about Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie's not here today because she's actually uh, at, um, running her own tutoring business in order to be able to pay for her Toronto mortgage, which she got approved for with stage four lung cancer. She's almost living 10 years now with lung cancer. She's one of the benefits of the targeted therapies that Dr. Shepard was just talking to you about. I want to introduce you to Lauren. Lauren at this time is probably about five o'clock now in Alberta. He lives in northern Alberta and he's probably picked up his granddaughter Ava from school and they're getting ready for supper. So he is a five-year survivor of lung cancer living with immunotherapy. So we, this is the progress and that is, this is the hope that has happened with the research that has been possible. So really, hope is here for lung cancer and hope is possible for lung cancer patients and their families. But despite this hope, lung cancer still has many challenges. Larry was just telling me about when he, was, he tells people he has lung cancer. The first question that they ask is often not how are you, but oh, I didn't realize that you smoked. The second is really talking about something that Dr. Shepard uh, had been talking about, is about access. The medication that has been keeping Anne-Marie alive, it was, approved, uh, it was approved by Health Canada um, in April of 2012, but it took over 1,400 days for our pro provincial health system to cover it. So at a 17% five-year survival rate, Lung cancer patients don't have that time to wait in order for the medications to be covered publicly. Now, why is this? And it, one, of, one of the reasons is due to the tremendous progress that research has been able to ma be made. When our healthcare system was designed, it was designed for a gold standard of randomized phase three clinical trials, and that wasn't wrong back then, but they never anticipated targeted therapies, and they never anticipated immunotherapies and things that would have just dr such dramatic response rates on phase two or even phase one, two trials. So it is time that we band together to modernize our healthcare system so that patients are not left waiting. The second relates to the cost of lung cancer treatment. We, have, we are very fortunate in Canada to have a socialist healthcare system, but as Dr. Shepard had mentioned, there is a public responsibility then. We have to be responsible for our healthcare dollars. And if you look at this chart, which was put out by the PMPRB, which is the Pan-Canadian Marketing, Price, Price, Pan -Canadian Pricing, Marketing Pricing Review Board for Pharmaceuticals, you can see that from um, 
2006 all the way to 2017, the average cost of a month of uh, cancer treatment went from $3,800 to $7,000. And some of the non-cancer medications that we are talking about are in excess of $10,000 a month. So given our publicly health care system, how can we expect this uh, to be sustainable and have money left over? So one of the things that we can do is realize as patients, as people working with patients, or as caregivers and loved ones, that research doesn't just stop when the publication occurs. It doesn't just stop when uh, the Health Canada approves the drug. It means that we need to continue to collect data and to collect and see how it works in actual real people that are placed into the real world. And we collect those individual voices of David's, of Anne Marie's, of Larry's, and, and Lauren's, and we say, you know what, this is data. We have proved that it is, it is working. We need to, we need to um, show that real world evidence so that we take the, some of the risk out of healthcare dollars. And we might have to say that, you know what? In trial, this drug has shown efficacy and it has worked, but in the real world, it doesn't. So that we might have to be prepared that we do have to give up some, some things. So, because the alternative is unacceptable. It is not acceptable and it is definitely not Canadian for lung cancer to turn into a GoFundMe campaign. So I leave you tonight with three tasks. One, the next time when somebody tells you that they've been diagnosed with lung cancer, please give them a hug, ask them how are you. The second, please advocate, and, and if you have a conversation with your elected official, please support that we need to modernize our healthcare system, and third, Please encourage people to get involved in research, whether it's before approval or after approval of drugs. And because I'm up here tonight, and because it is Lung Cancer Awareness Month, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask for your continued support for Lung Cancer Canada, as we have two other e events occurring in Toronto. One is our stakeholder briefing um, that's happening November the 13th next, month, uh, next week, and then one at the end of the month as we close out Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Thank you. So I'm going to have a couple of quick questions and I'm going to get you guys to jump in. I'm sure you have some uh, comments and questions after that. So Dr. Shepard, I want to start with, uh, I want to back up. You had a lot of interesting stuff in your uh, talk, but as I was listening, I was thinking, you know, why, why do some people get lung cancer and some don't? You know, say you can have two people who smoke three packs a day. Why? Is it just bad luck? Is it genetics? Unfortunately, there really isn't an easy answer to that. Um, there is no clear-cut genetic alteration that leads to lung cancer. There are some clues and some minor changes, and we know that there are families that have lung cancer, but the long and the short of it is that we really can't predict who's going to get lung cancer. And why do some non-smokers get it? Oh, that's even more of a mystery. No, <laughs> <laughs> no we have no idea why. Okay. And, and Christina, Dr. Shepard talked about nihilism, this, you know, oh, there's nothing we can do. Is that still existing or is people as hopeful of, as you were during your talk uh, in general? I believe the patients themselves are very hopeful. Um, and it, you know, what we need to do is really to get over... The, did you get the mic? Sorry. What we really need to do is, um, in order to make big strides in lung cancer and, and, uh, and get some of these programs and uh, screening funded, is really, to get, is really to make inroads into the stigma of lung cancer. We have to recognize that no one deserves lung cancer, and cancer is a terrible thing, whether, whether or not you smoked or, or you didn't smoke. And Larry, I'm interested, when you got your diagnosis, was, did you have sort of that, some of that nihilism, like, oh, lung cancer, it's all over, or were you, did you think it was like any other cancer? Um, I don't know if I'm going to answer this properly. <laughs> oh, it's your answer. There's no wrong answer. <laughs> um, I, um, I was caught by surprise. I, I, I caught a cold during the Super Bowl game um, in 2017, which is January, and that was my landmark. And the cold gradually went away, but this cough just persisted. It just persisted. Finally, I got a chest x-ray, and the doctor says, 
this doesn't look great. And then I looked at it myself. I said, yeah, I've got a atelectasis. So <laughs> I said, yeah, um, let's do um, a CT scan. I said, oh, heck, I'm going to order it myself. I ordered a CT scan, a PET scan. And uh, then I had to, f I was new to Florida at the time. So, uh, well, I knew to um, being treated as a patient. Um, and uh, I um, tried to find a thoracic surgeon to get biopsies done. Yeah, I was pretty well hands-on right through the initial, initial. That's why Dr. Leo looks at me like that. <laughs> I want to see my own CT. Anyways, yeah. And, and give us a sense of, you know, there's all these, well, chemo, your hair falls out, it's awful. Give us a sense, what's chemo like versus immunotherapy? Yeah. You know, initially I, th I thought it was nothing. It was really, um, you know, the first treatment, it was like, you know, Three weeks later, I'm going to have another one. The third treatment sort of hit me like a can of a ton of bricks, and I was getting radiation treatment at the same time, and uh, um, it was uh, pretty hard. Uh, I mean, the results, even post treatment, I've completed my treatments in November 2016, um, but the results and the side effects were with me for like three or four months afterwards. I think that's pretty well the rule for the cause. And what about how, in comparison, how is immunotherapy? Fantastic. I mean, I, you know, obviously I do get um, uh, a little bit of pneumonitis uh, uh, the third day after after I get an IV, but it lasts like eight to ten hours, and and I'm fine. I'm, you know, I I have a persistent cough, on and off, but um, otherwise I, I I walk four or five miles a day, and uh, I I'm just trying to figure out a different phase of my life right now. That's what I'm trying to do. No, well, you don't expect to hear that from a lung cancer patient. I'm no, I thought, you know, like I said, when I was reading over those results, you know, PubMed was dangerous to me. It was pretty depressing. And Christina, I want to go to the audience, but I, I want you to elaborate a bit more on the money question, because that's a big one. It is hanging over us. How much is too much to pay for these drugs? Oh, that's a good question. I think if you were to ask Anne-Marie or if you were to ask um, Larry here, then they'd mm -hmm. say that any, my life is not worth any sort of dollars, but I think what we have to do is really prove that these drugs are worth it and that they make a difference not only in the life of the patients, but what we don't count in when, in our, when we do our economic analysis is what is the cost on the family. So the drugs and the treatments like Larry is on or the oral medications like Anne-Marie is on, um, they, the p caregivers don't have to go to the hospital. They don't have to take time off of work. They're able to be independent. They're as the, the, they themselves are at many times able to also go back to work if they were, were in, are in uh, working age. So these are the things that we don't take into account when we talk about cost. And it, um, to get a more complete economic model, these are the things we should. And, and Dr. Shepard, can science bring the cost down? How, how are we going to make these affordable? Competition sometimes brings the cost down. <laughs> and as you could see, we have numerous of these agents that are uh, coming out for the, the treatment of lung cancer in, in particular. I think that all healthcare is costly. And there are many things that we do that have nothing to do with cancer or lung cancer or any uh, kind of cancer. I mean, we have transplant, etc. And, and I think most countries have set benchmarks of what is affordable. And it really has to be set at a population level. It's impossible for a physician to sit in front of a patient and say, we're not going to treat you because it's too costly. Um, so it has to be done at a population level. And the base is somewhere around $100,000 per year of life gained. So if your drugs are going to cost $10,000 a month... You're just on the edge there. Well, you're going to have to have more than two months yeah. on average. You can't treat five patients to get a year because that's going to be $500,000 per year of life gained. And, and we all have to come to grips with it. I mean, 
I, I ended up with our challenges, but we really have a fabulous healthcare system here. I, I wasn't meaning at all to be negative. I went to Brazil a month or so ago, and um, I was speaking for a pharma company. They were having a launch of their drug, and I wanted to end with the economic analysis. And they didn't want me to. We want you to take that out. It doesn't matter here. And I said, it does matter. And they said, well, no, no. They don't treat everyone. They only treat the wealthy. You know what the situation is like in Brazil, the economic situation. If you're not wealthy and if you can't pay $100,000 and have private insurance, you don't get it. That's not the way it is here. And, but in a universal system, all the more reason to look at the value, not exactly. just the cost. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Great. Yes. So, so any questions, comments? We'll go to the back first. Uh, you're fastest off the draw. Yep. We'll bring you a mic. It'll just be a second. So I have worked as a physician for 40 years, and uh, I have uh, been interested in all aspects of it. And I want to address the question of costs. So... Um, you have two types of pharmaceutical companies. You have the ones that produce a lot of the medication that is now off patent. And then you have a small number of pharmaceutical companies who are developing the drugs. The development of the drugs is not the work of the United Nations. That the development of the drugs is not the work of government Canada. It is given to these companies to do it. Why we do it like this, I don't know, but it has worked, in my opinion, very well. Now, you are one of these research pharmaceutical companies, and you have to spend an enormous amount of money to develop a new drug. So when you say you're paying $10,000 a month for a lung cancer treatment, you are not just paying for the drug for the treatment of cancer you are paying for the enormous cost of development of drugs. Do you want to give it to them as a grant from United Nations or as your governments? And this is, this is your grant, half a, half a billion dollars a year to development drugs? Then they could sell it to you for $500 a, a month. So remember, when you look at the cost of these drugs, you are actually supporting the research. And so it's hard, so hard for people to understand that. I have absolutely zero share of a pharmaceutical company, but I want to look at this thing with fairness. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll take that as a comment. Yes, go ahead. Um, Dr. Shepard, I really appreciate what you do. Um, I noticed that throughout three talks, you talked about how su uh, providing sufficient proof to the government to get funding for various drugs was a critical problem and was delaying for many years, five years, uh, the, the funding for certain types of uh, treatments, which then just consider how many people died. Uh, recently, uh, uh, a researcher at, uh, at UCLA, um, Judah Pearl, was given the ACM Turing Award for a new statistical technique which avoids RCTs, or for, the, uh, for people who may not know, randomly controlled trials, which you refer to repeatedly. And this uses statistical inference to uh, um, find causality. Why isn't this technique adopted by your group and other groups within the medical establishment in order to lower the cost of RCTs and proof sufficient for funding? Well, I think as we are cutting the pie into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, and I showed lots of pie graphs up there, we really have to come up with innovative ways of um, doing our research because it's very difficult and time consuming to do randomized clinical trials. They do remain the gold standard. There's no doubt about that. Um, so for these smaller subsets, I think you are going to see more and more approvals based on single arm trials. When this first happened with EGFR and ALK, 
the first two mutations that were identified in lung cancer, the approvals came, but they were conditional. And then the randomized trial had to come afterwards. But the approvals came to sell the drugs. In our system, that doesn't mean the government supports the payment for the drugs, though. But as more and more of these very small targets are being identified and we are showing very dramatic response rates, the response rates are two to three times what we see with chemotherapy when you directly have a driver target. I think now that most of the new drugs are being approved without randomized data. Our problem is that if our reimbursement czars are going to mandate randomized data, we are never going to get access because the majority of patients can't afford to pay for these drugs. I mean, it, it would be a financial hardship for every one of us up here to pay for them. So there has to be a recalibration of the thinking at Picoder if we are ever going to see more than just two of these agents approved. For osimertinib, which is the third generation drug that targets the resistance mutation in EGFR, and it's a beautiful drug, more active, less toxic, one of the most beautiful drugs developed, I will tell you, in the last decade or so. It got approved for sale in Canada. AstraZeneca had a compassionate program for over a year, and nothing moved at peak odor. Nothing moved. And so finally, they said, they, they gave a deadline. End of August this year, we are not supplying it anymore. And it took another six weeks, but then P. Coder came and approved the reimbursement. That's what we're stuck with in Ontario. So we probably have time for one last question. Anyone? So I'm going to ask, uh, you've answered every question ahead of time. So I'm going to ask each of you, uh, I, I think the theme tonight has sort of been anti-nihilism. So I want each of you to send me home with uh, one minute of something inspiring on, on this issue. Uh, where do you see the most hope in lung cancer? Dr. Shepard? Uh, the most hope. Um, smoking cessation will probably be the best thing overall. But having said that, um, I really think we may see some changes when we get widespread screening implemented. So the best thing is to prevent an advanced cancer. Because at the moment, the majority of patients are diagnosed with advanced cancer. So if we can move that up, so they're diagnosed with stage one and two, the cure rates are high, and you save lives. CT screening for lung cancer is cost effective, way, 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 way more, more cost effective than mammography. Uh, we have a target. We target smokers. We have a target audience. You don't have to screen everyone. Now, that won't find the 20% in non smokers, but we really have to move forward and get this implemented. And I'm not saying it's easy. It, it, it is not easy and it takes a lot of training for the radiologists to understand the changes and to have algorithms, algorithms for investigation. But I think that's something that we really need to focus on in our province and I think we're going a bit slowly. Now Larry, it's hard to be more positive than your talk was, but give us a try. <laughs> um, well, I've been treated on both sides of the border, so I could tell you that um, in Canada and Ontario that we have a top-rate uh, medical system. I wasn't denied anything in the United States either. I, I did have insurance. Um, but, you know, if, if the drug is life-saving, what's the price? Really? I mean, uh, obviously the price to me is a lot higher than it would be for you for me. But uh, you could actually 
turn the road around, uh, turn, turn, the whole, turn the whole story around, one out of every two people will wind up one type, one type of cancer. You know, whether it's squamous cell, basal cell, or advanced lung or pancreatic cancer, something's gonna happen. We've gotta know how to turn this, find this key and shut it off. That's all I have to say. And Christina, the final word. Um, I'm going to turn your question a little bit around, and I, I think the, 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 one of the biggest hopes right now, we really have, um, do have hope for the system. So as Dr. Shepard was mentioning with our multi-layered um, healthcare system, we are starting to see some, not in lung cancer, it hasn't happened yet, but some cancers where the drugs are being approved and then given conditional reimbursements based on collection of further data. We have patient voices that are now large enough to us to, for us to now collect these sort of what we call real world evidence that happens after trial that we can talk about putting it all into a registry and then proving to our health healthcare system that, you know, these drugs are worth funding. So I think the biggest hope for in, in, lung, in lung cancer are the patient voices itself and in converting it into a louder voice. Great. So I just want to end by thanking all of you for being there for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, thank our sponsor, Merck, and uh, the Gardner Foundation. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for, for their input. Thank you.